Hey, y'all. Guess what? We have a bonus business booster episode for you. A what? Boom. <laughs> a BBB. A BBB. A bonus business booster episode that what? comes from another B, a book club. <laughs> <laughs> all right you got to keep that in now you can't edit that out <laughs> club if you're listening on podcast you might want to quickly run over to youtube because that was kind of funny anyway, <laughs> i'm not going to tell you what it was so you'll go over and watch it just know that she is bursting about book club <laughs> i'm bursting about book club and business boosting bonus episodes so y'all I'm yeah. excited. Libby, tell everybody what you've done, what you've done, gone and did. <laughs> All right. So we have the Sea Chats book club. It is open to anybody, whether you are a reseller, any kind of entrepreneurial minded person. Come on in, join us. We do all sorts of books. Uh, we recently did Profit First uh, by Mike Michalowicz. And we had the author, the privilege of speaking with the author who also came to our book club of Profit First for e-commerce sellers, Cindy Thomason. And uh, so we got to sit down and have an interview with her and learn all about her business, Books Keep, and just really get down into the nitty gritty of it and how she runs her business and what it's all about and how she's, it's women supporting women. Love that. And um, how she implements Profit First, what some of her tips and tricks are. So, yeah, we wanted to bring that to you. So this is the serious side of consignment chats, the business serious side, not the goofy yeah. fun. Although I always got to put goofy fun. But real quick, I want to put some emotional in. Okay. I just want to say... <clears throat> I did not go to book club this time. I probably have not completed beginning to end a book club. That has nothing to do with the book club. It has to do with me personally. However, I was thinking the other day and got very like chills, regrew the hair on my legs while thinking about this from the, the chicken bump, whatever that's called. The chills. I got Goose it. Bumps. Goosebumps. Goosebumps. Chicken bumps. Goosebumps. <laughs> pigeon bones. Anyway, I was just thinking how amazing it is that Libby, you have come up with this book club last year, and you have not only implemented this into a quarterly thing, but just the fact of what you put into this, that you find experts in the field that come and join you in book club meetings to give more information to our sea chatters that are part of the book club. Like I was just thinking about this driving down the road the other day and just really had this holy moly moment where I've always appreciated that you've done it, but just how far you've gone with this, like how much you've offered to people in this book club for free. I mean, yeah, I we it. had three different experts this round of book club. You had authors, accountants, we a, a banking company to make give us tools and make it easier, which I personally implemented, and we implemented within consignment chats. And yeah, there's it's a lot more than just reading a chapter or a part of a book and discussing it. It's more here are the tools. I mean, you were doing spreadsheets and stuff for everybody, uh, right? I just All right. so it was really I, I've been part of book clubs, you know, whether they were for for fun, sitting around drinking wine, um, all, all sorts of book clubs in the past. But what I really wanted to bring to the table was something that was action oriented, things that um, RC chatters could really implement, take to heart, investigate. And not just read the book and set it aside and say, yeah, that was a good idea. So we spend weeks sometimes going through a book. This particular one, we spent 12 weeks and some of us fully implemented the process and got just so much out of it. And so we try to do it with all our books. Like we want action. We want something that you take away that changes your life or your business. And yeah. So I'm going to say you're succeeding at what you're dream was big time rocket well i yep. think our sea chatters are succeeding because to hear the amazing things the way it's changed people's lives and what they have implemented in their businesses in their personal lives i mean that's that's the real win there 
um, it is for our community. And I just, I just think everyone is just doing such a phenomenal job. Nothing brings me more joy than to, than to see that. Yeah. Well, I want you to take a minute. I love you because you do, you always make it about everybody else, but take a minute and just revel in pride and feel good about what you've put together because it's phenomenal. Bask in your business yeah. book club Booster. 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 <laughs> Bumpy, I don't Nanza. know. I'm Bananza. super uncomfortable, but I'm going to own it. And uh, thank you own for it. saying that. I appreciate it. I just had to throw that out there because yeah, Samantha and I sure. appreciate you and what you do, even though we don't always show up. It's amazing that you do it. <laughs> and I'm in awe of what you put into this. And I know that the sea chatters that join it are too, and very appreciative of what you do. And so y'all, if you haven't joined it, you know, might want to get in it, consignmentchats.com. You can find everywhere to find us. You can get part of our private community there. But first, like this, subscribe, and take a few minutes and enjoy this bonus business boosting episode. We are so excited to have Cindy Thomason here with us today, the author of Profit First for e-commerce sellers and owner of bookskeep.com. And uh, we're going to link everything up in the show notes. But first of all, I'm going to have, and you're an author of several books, as I understand. Well, two. Two, okay. <laughs> Feels like more than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but go ahead, introduce yourself. Let us know where you are in the country okay. and uh, what's who you are. Okay. Uh, well, right now I'm in North Carolina. Um, we're in the mountains, almost to Virginia. So uh, I think three miles, if I go north, um, I'll be in Virginia. So um, love being here in the summer because at home they're getting excessive heat warnings and it's 107 there yesterday. So this this 82 thing we got going on here is really pretty cool. <laughs> um <laughs> I'm normally in Arkansas, um, in the Ozark Mountains there, actually, uh, just south of Branson, Missouri. And our team at Bookskeep is is a remote team. So we're all over the United States. Um, all of my bookkeepers are U.S.-based. Um, and uh, their, their moms, you know, looking for uh, a way to, to engage professionally, um, but also do something else in their life. Um, many of them have young kids. They want to be at home or be available for the games or the lessons or whatever. Uh, some of them have elderly parents that they're caring for. And that's a whole, you know, doctor visit after doctor visit, unfortunately. And, um, and then I've got a few that are going to school. And so um, our, our philosophy really at Bookskeep is to provide an opportunity for those women who have accounting experience and want to contribute it to the household, but also to their mental, you know, um, many of us identify with what we do. And so the idea that they can work part time and not uh, and, and have a lot of flexibility when they work. It's why I started the business to begin with, and it's what I've tried to, to create when we hire for people. So we do accounting. Um, we do um, CFO advisory services that include profit first, but also like 13-week cash flow planning. Um, you know, it really does all come down to having cash in your business. It's great to be able to know how you've spent the money, but it's also really helpful to know uh, what kind of runway you have uh, before you run out of money and and be able to plan so that that's that's a long runway. So those are the kinds of things that we like to help our clients with. I love your mission and I love that that is who you employ and why you employ to provide, you know, a professional outlet uh, for people that have maybe different li living situations. And I think a lot of resellers could probably identify with that. So that's really exciting because we love to work with people that can understand um, a lot of our situations and really identify with it. I mean, how neat would it be to work with a bookkeeper that was in a similar situation uh, 
as myself, you know, I was a stay at home mom, but I also, you know, worked part time. And a lot of people don't understand the the challenges that come with that and what it's like running a business and also kind of having this other thing, you know, running the household, <laughs> running a business, taking care of parents, Kids, running around you while you do it all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's yeah. It, it it and it's not for everybody. I know we have hired women before that thought that that really sounded like the dream, but mm-hmm. then they got into it and they're like, "Just let me go to the office. <laughs> I cannot handle all of this all at the same time." And and you know, that's fine. I mean, there everybody can be different, and there's different situations. But I I know for me, I needed to be where my daughter was. Uh, She had Mm -hmm. some learning disabilities. I needed to be able to take her to tutoring. And, um, you know, it it just, this gave me, but I was just feeling like, who the heck am I? You know, I mean, I think as moms, sometimes we get lost in who we really are because we're always doing something for everybody else. And we're like, okay, who am I? Am I, do I even exist anymore other than in reference to my family? And so, um, for me, I was really missing my my work career. And so when I luckily, I mean, I wasn't figuring all that out. Luckily, a friend of mine needed help with something. And, you know, I was like, yes, I can help you. And then it started to hit me. This is what's been missing for me and um, really made a made a huge difference. So it really does excite me too to be able to see people have that chance to to do both because we are complicated people you know we 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 can't all just be super mom all the time yeah oh and it was born of helping someone else and yeah yeah, (laughs) I think sometimes resellers are like that and especially um consignment sellers right because a lot of us got in this business helping a family member clear out an estate or you know doing a friend a favor and just and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we have a business. <laughs> what the heck just happened? Um, hey, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about you guys the other day. I One of my good friends from when I lived up near, um, well, I lived in Hannibal, Missouri, which just across the river is Quincy, Illinois. And that's where my good friend lives. And they have a business up there and they are senior move managers. And I know they all the time are, struggling with what to do with the stuff you know some some family members want certain pieces and they help them you know get that shipped I mean you know anymore we don't always live down the street from where our families are and so and family can't be there to oversee the move so they that they they take care of those special pieces but then there's all the rest of it and it's too good to just put in the dump. So what do you what do you do with it? And I know they've worked with estate sales in the past, but I was thinking, you know, they need to connect with somebody like you guys to Absolutely. A, lot, a lot of that stuff. Some of it's like heirloom quality crystal and stuff that she's shown me before. And I'm like, I don't need another piece of crystal. <laughs> <laughs> <It's really beautiful. laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, that's one of the cool things about consignment is I, like I've done uh, like my, both of my grandmother's estates, And it's cool because the items, you're not just dropping it off at a donation center. Like somebody is purchasing these items. Yeah, they have wants them and appreciates them. It's not, yeah, even more than having like another life. It's so nice to know that, you know, like my grandmother's crystal vase that nobody in the family wanted is, you know, somewhere in England now. And somebody is just absolutely in love with it. And just, just that feeling of, doing that instead of dumping it off at donation. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. So, all right. So you do that, right. I'm going to get, I'm going to get into the meat of it here. All right. So we have your friends and they have a company and we've worked with a lot of different companies before, um, that, that do things like that. Right. And we sell the, we sell the excess either for the company or for the person that owns the estate. Uh, and, all right, I'm a reseller and I get in this big hall and I get this contract with this senior move manager and oh my gosh, <laughs> I have a business. Like, where do I start? Like what, I'm I'm coming to you and I'm like, Cindy, all of a sudden I have this e-commerce business. I'm selling stuff online for somebody else. Um, 
And I think this is where Profit First comes in. I didn't have the luxury of starting with Profit First. I wish I started my business that way. But what would you tell that person that hasn't even heard of Profit First or what would you tell them? How would they start? Well, you know, the the neat thing about Profit First is that it all starts with our behavior. And so Profit First is really built to work with how we think about resources. So money, for example, the the thing along with inventory that makes our business go um, is, is one of those resources. And if we leave it to chance, what happens is, and this is what, you know, most businesses do, they make their first sale or first 10 or 15 sales and they get that money in their bank account. And then they think, okay, well, what do I need to pay with this? And then they write all the checks and then there's probably not much left, right? And somewhere down the line, usually about tax time, they start adding up everything and they go to their CPA and they're like, you know, I did all of that and I have $500, <laughs> you know, or my business, you know, I was helping this friend. I was trying, I was deciding, you know, this is something I want to do. I was trying to launch my business. And at the end of the day, I would spent $40,000 in addition to what I took in. And I'm like, Mm-hmm. This is what used to be making me money. So at some point, if you don't start with profit first, you have this moment of reckoning where you realize I'm I'm volunteering. <laughs> you know, is this what I want to do to volunteer? <laughs> or um, you know, I am taking money out of my pocket and and putting it in somebody else's. What am I doing? So the neat thing about profit first is that you start from the beginning planning to pay for the important things in your life. And I say life because most of us as small business owners, we're doing this to end up putting money back in our personal pockets to contribute to our families, right? Mm -hmm. So, So with Profit First, what you do is you designate a certain purpose for the money that you get in. Now, if you work with like senior move managers, probably you get a lot of donated inventory. But if you're having to buy inventory, you need to set some money aside so that you can replenish inventory in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I think Uh, someone with a new business needs to think about, okay, maybe I'm not going to get a call every week from a a person to give me a donation. And I still want to keep this engine going. Maybe I'm going to go to, um, you know, yard sales or things like that. I don't know how you guys get your inventory, but, you know, I've got to have some money set aside to go and bring more inventory in. So the idea is to start to figure out, and it takes a little bit of work to figure out how much of what am I, the price that I get in, how much do I want to put aside to be able to acquire new inventory? Now, most of my clients that are, um, making a product and and having, uh, you know, they've got a patent for it and they get it manufactured overseas, et cetera. They, they spend about 35, 40% of their, you know, what they bring in, they put aside about 40% to be able to remake their product. So for you guys, I and mean, you guys can answer better than I can, like what percentage that should be, because I don't really know that for your consignment type industry, but you got to set that aside so that you can keep that part of the engine going. Then you've got the rest of it. And then the rest of it, you need to think about how much am I gonna pay myself as an owner? How much do I set aside for the government for taxes? Um, What percentage am I gonna set aside for uh, profit? And profit has two purposes. Profit is you're going to take a distribution out of your business every quarter to kind of reward yourself, but you're also going to leave a portion in there so that that starts to grow and becomes the rainy day fund. When something just really goes goes wrong, you've got some money to fall back on. Well, I can tell you, I'm going to interrupt. Sorry, nothing ever goes wrong, does it? (laughs) I've been doing profit first for a while, and I just used up my entire rainy day fund for a move. Mm. It's gone. And I was so happy it was there um, because my move also happened in the middle of like a a slow sales season, but it was there. It facilitated my move, um, which was really expensive. Uh, (laughs) And you're not worried about when your bills are going to get covered. Your consigners are going to be worried about it. It was totally separate. And if this move had happened before profit first, I, 
I, I don't know what I would have, I would have been scrambling and trying to figure out so much, so much. And it was all there. It was beautiful. So you designed into your business making profit. And and then it was there because you were building it up in that rainy day fund to then use for something special that, you know, uh, you know, a move sounds exciting. You know, I, I have a friend. Um uh, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Cheeky's Boutique, um, but Jessie Roberts is the owner of Cheesy, Cheeky's Boutique and her house burned down this past week. And it's just so, so sad. Oh. And, you know, sometimes rainy days are are really crummy. And, yeah. and the nice thing about having a profit account is that it, it, it doesn't mean that bad stuff won't happen. Um, it doesn't mean that there might not be a slowdown or whatever. It just gives you runway to plan so that you can make a better decision than if you're in the middle of it and you're panicking, and you're like, now what am I going to do? You know? And um, that that's the neat thing. It's, it's not that there won't ever be a rainy day or that um, you might not have to make some really tough decisions, but you've got the time to work through that and it not be, um, you know, just a spur of the moment, um, quick gut reaction because you didn't have time. And that's what I love about that profit account. So the other thing about the profit account, and I'm going to use a little something that happened last night in book club, um, somebody that just started profit first, they haven't hit their first quarter. So when you hit the, when you hit the first day of the first quarter, you do a profit distribution generally, where you take 50% of whatever's in your profit account and you do something, you do not put it back into the business. You do something totally for yourself, whatever it is, whatever it is, you can share it with your family, take a vacation, uh, buy a pack of gum, whatever it is, whatever's in that profit account, 50% of it, you get to do something really uh, rewarding and fun with. And she thought now the end of the quarter is probably in about 40, 40 days from today. Um, she thought it was in 10 days. She was so excited for that profit distribution that she had was going to end Ended the money, right? <laughs> yeah. She was like so excited to do her first profit distribution. She can't wait. And I'm so excited for her. But anyway. <laughs> well, it, and that's great because honestly, I don't run into that nearly as much as I run into people that say, I just want to plow it back into my business. Mm. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, it's not the right signals for your business. You you really do want to take that money out. I guarantee you, if you went and spoke to your family and said, you know, do you think my business kind of gets in the way of some of the things that we might do as a family? Uh, they're going to say, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> resounding like, yes, uh, entrepreneurial life. But if you went to them and say, hey, you know, my business is going to be able to afford for us to go to you know, Disneyland this weekend, then, then they start to see the rewards part of owning a business as opposed to just the struggles and challenges and not getting to see mom and whatever they start to see. Okay. So you put in the work, then you do get the reward. And so I think that's a good signal for, for moms to be giving to their families. And because I guarantee you, those kids are watching and they're paying attention and they're feeling you know, like mom's always working, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, what they, like one of the things I don't remember if I saw this in a group was that, um, you know, whether I or might even be in the book, but one of the things about being part of an entrepreneurial family is everybody participates, whether or not they're active. So I did when my kids were at home, I did a when I did my profit distribution, they got 10 percent. They got 10 percent of that. They each got 10 percent. And I remember like explaining to them and they were like, well, what? We didn't really do anything. I'm like, you do stuff every day. Like you might put the packages out at the doorstep or you might run upstairs and get me something like part of being um in an entrepreneurial family is, is that, and you earned this profit mm -hmm. and, you know, you've made sacrifices or you've done little things all throughout the quarter and, you know, this is your reward. So it was really well received and really encouraging to them. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. yeah. Now, one thing I, I will tell you that I advise my clients a little different than the taking the half. Mm -hmm. Um, and here's why um, I, I suggest for my clients at the end of the quarter to look how much money they put into that account. 
So if that account, let's say it has a balance of, um, I don't know, $5,000, but in this past quarter, you put in $2,000. So instead of taking out half of the 5,000, which would be 2,500, I say, look at what you put in and take half of that. And the reason I recommend that my clients do it that way is because most of them are starting with no rainy day fund. And I want them to build that up as quickly as possible. And because, you know, you're really, many of my clients are are working without that kind of rainy day fund and they are using debt. And so they're just, it's so easy to just get right back into borrowing the money again. But if you build up that rainy day fund, when something happens and you've got a little bit more money in there to work with, then you're able to avoid the trap of having to borrow the money to, to take care of whatever bad thing happened, you know? And so I want my clients to be in a position where they've got a pretty good rainy day fund, three to six months of their operating expenses as quick as we can get there. And so that's why, you know, it, it does mean you take a little bit less out. Um, instead of that 2,500, you would only be taking a thousand, but you start to see that profit account grow faster. And, and just that alone, that feedback of looking at your bank account and seeing it getting bigger every couple of weeks makes you want to do it more. And so, mm -hmm. and you're getting that insurance policy for when something bad happens. So I differ from Mike in the way I implement profit first. And it's because of that, because I, I do feel like that rainy day fund is just super important. And um, the clients that I deal with are, are operating when, when we start, they're typically operating without anything. And I want to get them somewhere as soon as possible. So they don't have to rely on debt to get out of a pinch. Yeah. Now, I, I have to say, like some of us, everybody, you know, in this business and in all businesses is in very different situations, but there are a lot of people that are like shutting down right now and going, mm -hmm. oh, but I have so much debt or I have zero, like I'm just living paycheck to paycheck. And it's, they're just, you know, caught in the cycle. And they think this is not for me because like profit first is not for me. You know, they feel kind of uh, embarrassed intimidate it, um, hopeless, just yeah. what would you, and I, I, it really hurts my heart to, to see that. Um, and I'm sure you have clients that come to you all the time like that. Like, would you tell people to, to, to reach out, to not be afraid of your numbers or. And, and don't be embarrassed. That? You know, I had a client, I, I do open office hours, um, once a month and my clients will call in and this woman called in and she says, I was so embarrassed to even make this call today. And I'm like, what? And she was, it was just, it did, it broke my heart. She goes, I, I've just been trying for so long to get on top of this and I just can't figure it out. And I'm like, well, that's why we're here. So it, it's nothing to be embarrassed about the fact that you reach out for help it gives you the chance to understand what's going on and see what the options are. Um, you know, it's just like not going to the doctor because you might find out that you've got something and well, if you, you're not going to get well, it, it, potentially if, if you don't get some help with, with getting well. And so I just really, uh, I hope anyone that is feeling nervous or anxious will reach out. I'd, I'd be happy to talk with them. Um, there are situations where I can't help. And it's because um, I, I did have a guy one time who called and he had 53 credit cards and they were all maxed out. He had you said 53? Yeah, 5-3. Uh -huh. And they were all to the max. He um, he told me from the beginning, I, I was looking at his books, and he said, we can't do anything about labor. I, I employ all my family. And I'm like, well, debt and labor are your biggest expenses, your interest and your, and your payroll. And I, I just saw it. I said, you've given me constraints that I can't work within. Now, if we can work within some of these constraints, then yes. But, um, but if you're open to let's looking at look at things, let's figure out what some options are. Um, then, then 
always there is a way out. Um, you know, look, just looking at what items are most profitable versus which items aren't profitable and quit investing and tying up money in those things that aren't profitable. Just tiny shifts like that, tiny shifts in pricing, they make, um, they go straight to the bottom line most of the time. And, and it is amazing to me how quickly you can see results when you turn when you turn the right lever and you commit to making one change and you start to see the benefit of that then you get a little less nervous about making another change and then just you know kind of step by step you end up starting to see that you're making you're making a dent and you're getting out of the situation i won't say it's fast i mean you know not like winning the lottery <laughs> it's a lot of hard work but um but but it is doable and once you start working on it you learn some things that allow you to um accelerate what you're doing because then you're starting to see the patterns and how you can take what you learned and apply it um beyond just that one one step so to speak yeah that's, that's amazing. I imagine like if somebody comes to you and they're embarrassed and intimidated, I, I can imagine this, I can imagine myself in this situation, um, just being like embarrassed and intimidated and, you know, not seeing the way out almost like, you know, not wanting to go to the doctor is very similar. I imagine it is your, much like many doctors, your passion to be able to help that person. I imagine nothing feels better than helping somebody that is coming from an intimidated, embarrassed, hopeless situation. Um, when you start to see the light bulbs go on that they see, okay, yeah, that's a path. I can, I can do that one thing. Um, and then the next time you get together, you, they're excited because they seem, okay, look, look what we were able to do. And I paid this one credit card off, you know, I'm like, okay, now, now we're only down to 52, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's really exciting to, because you're, you're really helping that person get back in touch with what, what they were dreaming about, you know, I mean, no, none of us got into this because, we wanted to feel stressed out all the time and not know how we were going to pay our bills. Right. I mean, that's not what we signed up for. So to, to realize, and, and, and then they start comparing themselves to other people. Well, so-and-so can do it. And, and I saw in the Facebook where and this just, just drive me crazy. I had this one client, it's Mark in the book. Um, and he would say, am I doing okay? I'm like, you're doing amazing. You know, he never took on debt. He was debt averse from the beginning. And he's like, I don't want any debt. I'm like, okay. And then he would say, but all these guys in my mastermind, they're like growing five times faster than me. I'm like, okay. Is that what they told you? Yeah. <laughs> You've seen their books? No. I said, do you know how much debt they have? No. I'm like, okay, then you don't know enough. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's that comparison, I think, is just so hard when we do that, when we start comparing how we're doing with someone else. And that I think that's crippling, too, that um, even if we're embarrassed about our own situation, we make it worse because we think, well, you know, Libby's doing so good, you know, and it's um, you're not Libby, you know, you're you're playing your own game and let's work on what your situation is and we'll get we'll get to what needs to be done. That has been such Absolutely. a theme this week. We yeah. know, that's our episode that we're releasing today. Okay. Um, so I'll link that up for everybody in the show notes. But um, the other thing was we were just coming off our Patreon, um, Patreon mastermind call. And that was the theme of the call was, it, I mean, we didn't bring it up. It was, it was, you know, our, our patrons that brought it up was just comparing yourself and how how detrimental that is to everything. You have no idea what somebody else's story is. And mm -hmm. like you said, you have no idea what somebody else's books are. Like you right. have no idea. Well, and you know what's so funny? After talking to entrepreneur after entrepreneur, I had, I had, I did sales for a long time for the business and they would call me and they would tell me, oh, we're doing great. I'm seven figures this and I'm doing, oh, you know, and I'm like, okay, great. I said, but for me to give you a quote, I need to see in your book. So invite me in. And so I get in there and I start poking around. I'm like, am I in the right books? What is it talking about? <laughs> and then I realize they just they just make this stuff up, you know? And I'm like, okay, um, 
I knew it. I knew it. It happens. It happens. I can, as a bookkeeper, I will never say who does what. I will say (laughs) it is a trend that entrepreneurs see things with their rose colored glasses on. And um, that's the best way I know how to describe it is they are looking for it with the, at the best uh, outcome possible. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. That's great. That's, I mean, that's, that's a really good lesson. I worked in um, mortgages for a while and that would, that's what I would tell people. Like you have no idea like how people are living, like people with these big how like, the vast majority of them are just so saddled in debt. Like it's not what you see. It's not a highlight. Re- like it's, uh-huh. it's it's not what you think it is. So no. don't even bother comparing. Yeah. No. Doesn't help you one bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard enough to know what we want without that. Right. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time just for myself. What What is it that Cindy wants, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's hard enough to compare it to somebody else. It's just like, oh, why? and Anne Lamont, I think, says it the best. She says, don't compare your insides with somebody else's outsides. And I just thought that was, mm. you know, and we can't oh, wow. know anybody else's insides. So we're all we're doing is looking at the outside. I love that. Truth. Yeah. <laughs> you seem yeah. to have such a, an incredible, strong mission for your company. And personally, what is it? you know, what is it that, that drives you that really, Mm. I think I see that. So I'm curious as to how you're going to answer, because I think I know. Well, I've been working on this quite a while and I don't have it in front of me, but I'll try to say it because I I've been working with Simon Sinek's golden circle, you know, the why, the how, and the what, and I I've really been working on my why and my why is I believe that is every, I believe it is a right for every woman to, um, to be able to create the work and family life that she desires and to be able to take care of her mind, her body and her soul to achieve her personal and professional dreams uh, and generate wealth. So that's, I just feel like women should have that opportunity. And just before we got on the call, I, I was looking, I've been curious about this for a while, but we've been able to put all of our clients on um, the system that we use for reporting. And I can look at them side by side. And I wanted to see, are women different than men? And so I just went through and picked out a handful of both. And I don't have enough in there now to really have a sample, but it was really interesting to me. Revenue wise, they're very similar. Gross margin wise, they're very similar. But profit wise, women are taking out much or or their profit margin percentage is much lower than men's. And I can't wait to dig into that because I'm like, all right, what's causing that? You know, because that that's money that we as women are somehow spending that men aren't spending. And why is that? And I don't know the answer, but uh, I'm going to find Sounds out. like a next book. Like yeah. I'll definitely be reading that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm like, sure. My immediate thought was that the profit was lower because women tend to value themselves and what they do a little less than men do. That was my, that was just my initial reaction. When you said that, I thought that's where you were going. That may be. Um, and maybe and maybe they're spending on other things um and you know parkinson's law is maybe maybe they're not putting themselves up there um or maybe they're in households where they're viewing what they do to be supplemental and not foundational i, I don't know i'm i'm actually yeah, see that a lot in our community Um, where it's, where it's supplemental. And even in, even in cases where the women, maybe the wives are out earning the men, it's still looked at it in, in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Yeah. And you know what, a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs, and this happens with men, not just women, but a lot of entrepreneurs um, don't realize that they should be building their business and setting aside money to pay themselves, not just so that they take money out for their family, but so that if something happens to them and they're incapacitated, you know, for whatever reason, that they can pay somebody to go in and do that thing that they had been doing. And I I just think um, it's, 
it's it's a bad signal to the finances of a business to not pay yourself because then it makes it look like you can do more with less resources and if something were to happen to you then you've got to put somebody in there that could manage you know you know hopefully they could figure it out and they could could manage and keep that engine going otherwise everything shuts down and so as you said, uh, women value themselves less. So maybe they're not um, setting aside that money for mm-hmm. the effort that they do in the business, just thinking, um, you know, it'll never happen to them or, you know, um, I'm going to, I'm going to keep more money in my inventory bucket so I can keep, you know, growing faster, but it's, it's, it's artificial. It's it's like um, when you, when you bring money in. I'm not opposed to debt if if it's if it's smart. Um, but what I see is people use debt to get them out of a sticky situation instead of using debt to to grow strategically and know how they're going to pay it back. And when you when you bring in when you bring in money and uh, this a lot of this happened as a result of COVID and there was so much money coming out through governmental programs and people were getting it and they were just spending it in their businesses without any expectation of return. They just was like, yeah, this, you know, this, this will make this better and, and, but not really paying attention. And then you're left with how do you pay that back? Now, luckily a lot of those are very um, low interest loans, but it still has to be paid back and it takes away from what you can actually take home. And so it really kind of art puts you in an artificial situation. Um, whereas that's, what's really cool about profit first is you grow organically. Um, I, I've met with accountants in my industry before. And um, this one gal I met and she was like twice as big as we were. And she said, when do you think we're going to start making a profit? And I'm like, what? What? Well, wait, why are you making a profit now? You know, I mean, you're bigger than me. And, and she goes, I don't know. We're just not making a profit. And I was like, okay, um, no, that's not my philosophy. I, 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 I want money at the end of the day for what I'm doing, you know? So it's, it's interesting to think about. I just tell people with the second somebody says to me, it takes money to make money. Um, I like to just hand them the profit first book or just show them the profit first book or send them a link to the profit first book. Um, because consignment is an industry where you can literally start with zero mm-hmm. and build your business without any. Um, so we're, we're just really big on, on that. And uh, it doesn't take money to make money. No. Yeah. So hey, you're paying attention to the money you make. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This is, but do you guys have any like um, follow-up questions, Molly, Samantha? Just no? a big thank you. Yeah. yeah. I want to know what the guy with the 53 credit cards, what kind of wallet does he have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may, may, maybe there's an opportunity there for a private label product, you know, so right. <laughs> Make a really big fat wallet, yeah. Um, <laughs> it was no point in him carrying them because he couldn't. They were all maxed out. Let so. <laughs> me right. right. just put them in a drawer. All right. Oh, so, cool. yeah, do you have anything to drink there? Because we usually cheers at the end of our episode. But I do. Not- I do. Oh, I, I do. So. <laughs> well, cheers. Thank you guys for having me. This was so fun. I can't believe we're Thanks done. Thanks for coming. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for joining Libby, Molly, and Samantha, the ladies of Consignment Chats, as we build a resourceful community of collaborative resellers. Find all the ways to connect with us on consignmentchats.com. Episodes are available on YouTube and anywhere you get your podcasts. In addition, join our free private Facebook community.